Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources webinar on OER funding and impact me measurement. I'm Matthew Bloom. I'm English faculty at Scottsdale Community College and one of the tri chairs of the Open Maricopa Project, also um, on the Executive Council of CCC OER. And I will be moderating this web webinar today. Very excited um, to have a number of projects and approaches related to um, securing OER funding and developing mechanisms and applying mechanisms for tracking the impact that, that the projects can have to kind of justify uh, getting the money in the first place. Um, we do have presentations from the Midwest Higher Education Compact, uh, the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions. Uh, in their OER project. And then we also have um, someone from the InSpark uh, Learning Enterprise, which is also related to Arizona State University's uh, Center uh, for Education Through Exploration. Um, before we get into all of that, however, um, I just wanted to mention, we will, they'll have the opportunity to introduce themselves as they come here. Um, we have Jenny Parks from uh, the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Uh, Katie Zabak, who is uh, from the OER Cost Savings and ROI Research, Kelsey Smith, OER Librarian from West Hills College, Lemoore, and hopefully, I don't think he's on the call yet, but hopefully he'll join us a little bit later, is David Schoenstein, um, who is uh, the head of InSpark um, and the work that they're doing with EPX at Arizona State University. And as I said, I will be the moderator today. Um, but first, a little tiny bit, this is kind of the obligatory um, uh, overview of CCC OER for those of you who may be new uh, to the work that we do. Uh, we are a consortium of, of um, basically members of institutions, community colleges primarily, across North America. Um, you can see that we have 94 members in 34 states, and um, that continues to grow, and we're excited about that. What we do is we provide support uh, to all of our members. Um, the mission is to expand awareness and access to high quality OER, um, support faculty in the development of resources and their ability to actually use resources, um, also fostering regional OER leadership. And all of that, of course, has the purpose of supporting students in the end and making them more successful. So one thing that um, we wanted to try to cover here a bit, and I'm gonna pass it over to um, Una Daly, who's actually the director of CCD OER, to talk a little bit about just how all the different kinds of funding streams that are actually even available for, for OER. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Can you hear me okay? Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> I uh, surprised Matthew with this basically last night saying, hey, you know, some of the funding sources um, we won't have time to talk about today, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, and um, one in particular that we're not going to specifically address today is the Federal Emergency Relief Funds. And I think many of you have heard about those. Um, higher education was actually allocated almost $40 billion just in March of this year. And there was monies available before as well um, for higher education. And this was around the pandemic. Um, and so um, Spark recently conducted kind of an informal survey uh, about institutions, higher ed institutions, um, that had used this money uh, for uh, OER initiatives. And so I, I can report, thanks to uh, the lovely people at Spark, that community colleges from California, Oregon, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Iowa, Wisconsin, and others have reported receiving monies to fund their OER programs. And how you do this is that these are grants that you get from the federal government or your institution would. Um, and um, they have to be aligned with the criteria and OER aligns quite well with three criteria from uh, the grants. And that's student re-engagement, uh, reducing financial barriers and distance learning conversion. Um, so um, I would suggest that you talk to the folks at your institution who received those uh, emergency funds and find out um, if they've been allocated and what's still available because OER can very closely be aligned with the criteria for the grants. And that's really all I had to say. So thank you, Matthew, for letting me share that. Absolutely. Thank you for providing that overview for us. Um, so I guess without further ado, we'll just go ahead and, and introduce the first um, of our guest speakers today, who's Jenny Parks. She's Vice President of the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. 
Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Una, for having me here today. Um, I'm excited to be here and to share the work that we've been doing at MEC and in conjunction with the other regional higher ed compacts around the work of OER. Next slide, please. Um, one of the people who will be sharing that work with you is a researcher, Katie Zabak, a consultant on OER cost savings and, our, and the return on investment research that MEC has commissioned under a Hewlett grant that we share with the other regional compacts. Next. And she will also be um, sharing some information from some others. Um, Kelsey Smith, an OER librarian at West Hills College. I think what we want to do is go ahead and let um, uh, let Katie share her slides. I oh, think there we go. OK, thank yeah. you. Then I'm going to do. OK, so here's the thing. At MAC, we have joined with the other regional compacts under what we're calling the National Consortium for Open Educational Resources, NCOER. We have a Hewlett grant to engage in a number of activities to increase the um, capacity for offering OER in all of our states, but also with an emphasis on um, increasing equity in higher education and doing so. One of the ways that we at MEC thought we needed to tackle this was to look at the ways that our returns on investment and the ways that um, cost savings are calculated for OER. Because honestly, um, when you look at all of the different ways that these things are calculated and reported, sometimes the message gets lost and the folks who are um, consuming that information just don't always know how to compare apples to apples and what to make of it. So again, I'll show, this is um, the work that we're doing in conjunction with the other compacts and the specifically in MEC, we're doing this research on um, cost savings and return on investment calculations. So I'm gonna turn it over to Katie. Thanks, Jenny. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being part of this conversation. Can Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Perfect. OK, so um, I am so excited to be working with um, Mech and um, this great group work group that you see on your screen right now to um, start to develop some standards around cost savings and how we measure cost savings and return on investment, which I'm trying to rebrand as cost benefit analysis. Um, so I think that the reason that MEC got involved in this um, project and the reason that they pursued this project as part of NCOR is because um, one of the best ways for our state that our state legislators have been able to advocate for OER funding at the state level is by showing the uh, cost savings that OER presents to students. Um, and we know in the field that there's a lot more to OER than, than cost savings, and there's a lot of other benefits um, to OER than cost savings. But having the cost savings conversation and the return on investment conversation really opens the door to talk about some of those other factors. Um, I know that uh, prior to becoming a consultant, I uh, most recently came from the Colorado Department of Higher Education, where I had the great pleasure of working to advocate for our OER um, programs at the state level and being able to talk about costs, but also um, look at the other factors that are improved by OER was something really powerful in our legislature. So very excited um, to be part of this work. So one of the things that we wanted to do um, when Jenny came to me and asked me if I would be willing to, to work on this, I said yes. And I said that there's a lot of research and a lot of really good work already being done. And so what we need to do is create, um, bring the smartest people in the field together um, to come to some kind of agreement around what it looks like to measure cost savings of OER um, and to put that down on paper so that people can reference it. And so we put together a great group of individuals who are on this slide. A couple of them are also on, um, on this webinar. So thank you so much for those of you who have already contributed. And we've been meeting regularly and then taking the ideas that get generated and the other good work that's already being done, been done in the field through both research and practical application to bring stuff, something together so that we can release a final report and a final set of recommendations. So what are we doing? Um, at, at the basic level, what we are doing is creating a set of principles to improve the consistency and reliability in the field of measuring cost savings and the return on investment of OER. 
the final product will make it possible for someone to recreate and or replicate a final number. Um, we're not sure if we're gonna uh, publish a final number as part of this work. Um, and, but what we do know is we wanna create some um, standards around what the right uh, approach is. The group that we are targeting this is our decision makers. So those are people who are legislators, they're institutional leaders, they're um, department heads who are ha having to make decisions about resource allocation. Um, we want this to be accessible to students, parents, faculty members, but really the uh, this tool is designed to help change hearts and minds at the top and to help uh, advocate for additional resources for open education resources. Um, and why is this important? So it's important for a number of reasons. The first is that the people like I used to be when I worked at the state of Colorado who are advocating for OER um, at higher levels, they need a concise statement that clearly articulates and communicates the value. Decision makers, people who have to implement um, or decide whether or not to fund OER programs, they need um, some consensus-based metrics to use or to customize for their own decision-making purposes. Leaders need to understand uh, what good work has already been out there and then be able to adopt it quickly. For those of you who work with high-level leaders, you know that they don't have the luxury of sitting around and figuring out what the best answer to a decision, uh, what the best answer is. They need uh, information quickly. Practitioners who have limited time also need shortcuts. And um, finally, we all need to ensure that OER is continuing to add value. And so this, the point of this work is to create some standards so that we can continue to measure the work that we're doing. Um, so these are some of the key questions that our research is uh, aiming to answer. What are the current models? Oh. Sorry, my, uh, my Zoom screen has, is covering up my... Uh, just a second. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> there we go. What are the current models of cost savings and return on investment that are in the research? There's a lot of them. One of the things that I'm pleasantly surprised about in working in this industry is how much work you all have done to um, research yourself. Um, what are the best practices for states and institutions that are already measuring cost savings in ROI? We don't wanna reinvent any wheels. We know that there's good work already happening. What's the difference between cost savings and return on investment? This is a really pertinent question that we've had a lot of conversations around. How is cost savings and ROI different for the state, the student, and the institution? Because they, they are different lenses. Um, how do we define ORI, OER, when we're um, measuring cost savings? And so that's something we're tackling as well. What's the time horizon of measuring the impact of OER? Um, and how do we account for non-monetary costs? Things like faculty time, structural changes, um, the returns to students, um, additional access, the various different returns that the research shows. How do we think about um, in integrating those into a cost savings? Um, so what you can expect to see from this is some guidance around what it looks like to measure cost savings. Um, I've put some best practices in here, but as a general rule, people identify the number of courses, they identify the number of students enrolled in those courses that have OER, and then they um, develop some kind of multiplier, the amount of money they saved with OER. And that's really where a lot of the work is happening is for us to understand what's the standard around that, what that multiplier should be. The second um, side of this is how do we give people guidelines for a return on investment calculation or some kind of cost benefit analysis calculation. So from an institutional and state investment side of things, um, institutions and states put money into things like course development, faculty release time, um, integrating the, the um, textbooks, um, and then the losses of bookstores. And then from an institutional side, um, in terms of 
of returns, there's things like increased course enrollment, increased credit accumulation, improved retention. This is not an ex uh, exhaustive list, but those are the kinds of things we're looking at as part of our cost benefit analysis approach. And then finally, you can expect a set of principles from this work. So um, these are the working principles right now. They continue to be massaged through feedback from the field. But um, they start with the idea that all students should have access to course materials for their classes. If there's course materials, it means that those are probably needed for the class. And so we need to assume that all students should have access to them. OER resources support learning in the same way as commercial or all rights reserved materials. Um, and research shows they are equally or possibly more effective. Um, we know that good course development happens regardless of whether or not you're using a commercial or all rights um, reserved material versus OER. You have to do course development and you have to integrate whatever material you're using into that course. Developing um, new OER resources is not always required for our OER efforts. Um, and so we need to take into account that new development doesn't always have to happen. Um, OER has benefits beyond direct cost savings that should be acknowledged. And we hope that any cost benefit or any um, analysis acknowledges those. Consistency is important, but to scale estimates um, are probably going to be a valuable tool. So we're not gonna get it exactly right all the time, but an estimate is a really good proxy for decision-making. And you need different levels of specificity and cost savings and ROI estimates, depending on which stakeholder you're working with. So when I'm talking to a legislator, I need much less precise calculations about what my cost savings are going to be with OER than I do if I am a department head who actually has to um, budget on those things. And so those are the elements of our work and we continue to work on packaging those um, to provide more clarity to the field so that going forward, um, there is more clarity in how we look at cost savings. Thank you, Katie. Uh, this is Jenny again. I just, I, uh, a number of you have asked, will these slides be available? They will, because um, I agree, they're fabulous. And I just can't thank Katie enough for her leadership and insight in doing this work. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, again, I think just like a lot of, um, uh, uh, one of the things that I thought was especially interesting about that was really distinguishing between the cost savings alone and the actual return on investment. I think that that's very meaningful and something that um, a lot of um, projects maybe overlook, perhaps. So that's really helpful. Um, I do want to go ahead and share my screen here so I can get the slides back up. And we have um, Kelsey Smith from West Hills College Lemoore. She's going to be talking a little bit about, about the, uh, the Ed Grant project that they've got going on. All right, thank you, Matthew. Um, let me pull up my slides. Oops. Okay. All right, so my name is Kelsey Smith. I am the OER librarian at West Hills College Lemoore. Um, West Hills College is one of the community colleges in Central California. So today I'll be talking about, oh, um, we abbreviate this because our, the title of our project is very long. Um, if we abbreviate it CC ECHO, it stands for California Consortium for Equitable Change in HSIs. HSI stands for Hispanic Serving Institutions. For those of you who are unfamiliar with that abbreviation, um, Open Educational Resources. So I am the project director for this particular grant. Okay, so our funding source for this project is the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, this is the Open Textbook Pilot Program. We were one of four awardees for the fiscal year 2020. And um, I have the link there. I don't know if somebody wants to put the link in the chat, but if you're interested in seeing the abstracts for the other three awardees, um, there is a page for that. 
And um, if you're unfamiliar with the open textbook pilot program is, it is what funded um, the library text uh, project from uh, UC Davis that was back in 2018. So every year since then, we've had um, another project or projects funded by the open textbook pilot program. Um, our CC Echo project will run from this year until the end of 2023. And I actually wanted to ask Uno or anyone else that may be familiar, um, is there plans to continue this open textbook pilot program funding every year like they have been? Uh, from what I've heard, Kelsey, yes, there, there definitely is plans, um, but it's, it's still being negotiated what the amounts and so forth would be. Okay. I was trying to find that information today and I, I couldn't, so that's good news. So for those of you who may be interested in what this program is, if there is future funding, here's a description. I won't read the whole thing except for the bolded part here. So basically this program is uh, focused on demonstrating the greatest potential to achieve the highest level of savings for students through sustainable expanded use of the open textbooks in high enrollment courses or in programs that prepare individuals for in-demand fields. So the open textbook pilot is very much focused on either high enrolled high impact courses or CTE career technical education. So CC Echo is uh, we're focused on those high enrolled high impact courses but a lot of the other awardees um, are focused on career technical education. This comes from the, uh, their site specifically. So it's just, if you're interested in applying, you need to have at least three institutions of higher education in a consortium. So CC Echo has four colleges. We're all California community colleges. Um, you need to have some sort of ed tech person on board or a curriculum design expert, and then also an advisory group. Um, you also, the at least three, in your consortium should have demonstrated experience in OER, basically. So the four community colleges, which are West Hills, College of the Canyons, College of Marin, and Allen Hancock College, we all have experience in the zero textbook cost degree grant that was previously done um, in California, as well as OER, OER programs on our own campuses. So we're very, very experienced in OER. Um, and so if you apply for this or any other funding, it's very important to highlight that, highlight your experience um, in the OER field. The application for this was very intense. Um, and uh, keep in mind, this is a consortium thing. So at least three colleges. Um, it was, it's difficult to do when it's not just one college working on a grant application. Um, it's 60 pages. Um, it was a lot of teamwork and trying to schedule time that we can all talk and it was tough. So the most important things to focus on on the application is really establishing the need. So why do you, why does the country or the state need your project in particular? Um, what are you doing that's so special pretty much? Um, for CC Echo, we really focused on how the pandemic and the transition to remote learning really um, exacerbated the inequalities between underrepresented, um, underrepresented racial groups in higher ed, uh, in particular Latinx students in HSIs. Um, the goals of our project um, were to fill the OER gaps in those high enrolled courses. So there are courses on our four campuses that have a lot of students enrolled in them, but they still aren't using OER textbooks for some re reason, either it doesn't exist or the faculty aren't happy with what's out there. And our goal is to create an OER textbook for them. Um, we also wanted to create our OER textbooks based around a diversity, equity, and inclusion framework, as well as have them peer reviewed. And then another big goal of ours is to share out all the resources we either use or create um, during the length of our grant. And one way we established the, the need for what we are going to be doing was doing a initial OER gap analysis well before we did the application. So we looked at all of the high enrolled courses on our four campuses, saw which ones were using OER, which ones weren't. And then we kind of decided from there which ones we would work on. 
And we will be doing a gap analysis every year because um, as we do our work, OER is being created all the time. So what's a gap this year may not be a gap next year. So we will keep doing gap analysis and make sure we are working on what is needed and not uh, recreating what's already out there. And another important thing to highlight in your application uh, for in, any sort of funding is um, how you would be measuring the impact of your project, how you know it's successful. Um, will you be using qualitative and quantitative data? What's the return on investment? Um, every, pretty much everything Katie just talked about, you know, the cost savings, how are you going to be figuring that out? Is the return on investment different from cost savings? Are you going to be looking at retention? Um, enrollment, um, things like that. Um, CC Echo has a contract with RP Group. They will be doing our data collection and analysis for us. Um, so we are excited to have them on board. So here's some of the performance measures uh, we'll be using in particular, but this is going to be, look different for every project. Um, we're looking at the number of students enrolled in courses uh, with this CC Echo adopt, uh, created textbook. So when we create an OER textbook, if a course adopts this, we'll be looking at the number of students in that course, uh, the number of students that actually complete the course, um, DFW rate, which is uh, DF letter grades, which is the failure rate and withdrawal in the course. And these OER courses compared to a course that is using a commercial textbook. So if one of our campuses has a macrobiology course that's using one of our created OER created textbooks and a traditional textbook, we will be looking at the DFW rate in both of those. The average grades in those courses that have adopted our textbooks, um, the number of faculty that are adopting within our consortium and outside of our consortium too, and then cost savings. Um, another thing to focus on on applications is uh, be sure to introduce your team. So who is going to be involved in your project? Uh, what would their role be, their responsibilities? What's their experience in the open education, um, their uh, education, if that's relevant, their credentials, their experience, etc. And be sure to highlight who will exactly be responsible for what, who's your project director? Um, do you have a grants team? on board, um, et cetera. Uh, we also, since we have four colleges involved in this project, we also laid out exactly what college, each college will be doing and what their responsibilities and duties will be. And then of course you have to create a budget. So how much money will you need to achieve the goals that you outlined earlier? Um, and then keep in mind, uh, we figured this out a little bit late, but when you're working in a consortium with different colleges, keep in mind that every institution pays faculty a little bit differently. Um, some will do stipends, some refuse to do stipends, some will do release time, some do hourly pay, and um, at least in California, the hourly rate is different at every college. And then also, if you're going to be paying faculty outside of your institution, how does that work? Make sure you know how that works. Some colleges can't do that. Um, others are fine doing that. Um, and then you may want to have just one college of the consortium kind of handling the budget, or in our case, each of the four colleges has their own budget and handles their own money. And then sustainability and scalability. So when you're working on an application for any sort of funding, um, be sure to describe how a, your project will be sustainable after the funding ends um, and how can it be scaled up. Um, so for CC Echo, all of our professional development courses that we will be creating will be shared publicly. Right now, they will be on Canvas Commons. Hopefully, it will be in a different format for other um, LMSs um, for adaptation and reuse. Um, people can adapt these and edit them to use at their individual institutions. Um, these will be self-paced or facilitated um, courses. And then all of the OER that we will be creating, whether it's a textbook or a course, shell, um, ancillary, those will all be shared to our website, which I have failed to put on this uh, slide. Um, so we'll be putting those on our website and then hopefully other repositories like LibreText, um, cool for Ed, et cetera. Um, and then all of the 
data that we will be, the RP group will be gathering for us um, that will be published. And then hopefully, especially HSIs, other HSIs will be able to use this data um, to justify and bolster their own OER funding on their campuses. Um, so when we, if we get some great student success data saying that the OER textbooks that we created with CC Echo, the students are performing much better in these courses, especially the Latinx students. Other colleges can use this to kind of show their own institutions why um, their OER initiatives may need more funding and um, things like that. I think that was my, yeah, that was my last slide. So I don't know if we're doing questions now or later, but that's all I have. Well, thank you very much for, for all that. That seems, I mean, as some of the comments in the chat have indicated, this is a very, very valuable playbook for, um, for others who may be looking forward to uh, trying to secure some funding um, in a large scale project like that. So thank you very much for sharing that. We're gonna, um, if any questions come up in the chat or something, we'll save those for the end. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move here forward with our next guest. Let me share my screen one more time. All this back and forth is kind of okay. So anyway, uh, yeah. So next up, we have David Schoenstein. He is, as it says here, the uh, head of the Inspark Learning Enterprise at Arizona State University, where uh, he works with the Center for Education Through Exploration. And full disclosure, the project, uh, the Open Skill Grant project that he'll be mentioning, um, I'm directly involved in that as well in my role in Maricopa. Um, and so uh, we're happy to have him talk a little bit about his experience, not just on that grant necessarily, but on some other projects that he's also worked on. So go ahead and take it over. Thank you, Matthew. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to just say that I subscribe to, uh, you know, everything that um, uh, Kelsey was, was saying. So lots of really good detailed points there. Uh, I can maybe try and just add some color um, by talking about the uh, three grants that I've been working on and some of the strategies uh, that we have used for um, acquiring the, the funding and winning, winning some of these grants. Um, and then also, as Matthew uh, mentioned, it would be great I can um, to dive in a little bit on this uh, Department of Education grant. So same open textbook pilots uh, project that um, Kelsey was talking about, where, uh, so that project's called Open Skills. So we can, we can kind of drill down a little bit on that one. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the evaluation uh, that we're doing and how that has even shifted throughout the project. I think that might be interesting. Um, yeah, and, and, and measuring impact. So, um, the three big grants that I have been involved in was a four and a half million dollar grant from the Gates Foundation. That was the Next Generation Courseware Challenge. So that was all about uh, scaling uh, high quality courseware. So lots of active learning. Uh, and that was in an effort to really, really try and tip the market there uh, towards the um, to, to, you know, to courseware and this low cost courseware specifically for students who are low income minority first generation students. So, uh, so that was a lot about developing and scaling. Then uh, we, were, we, we have this uh, um, Department of Education grant, which is Open Education Resources. Um, that is similar, um, although it's focusing on active learning with OER. Uh, and so there um, we were in partnership with uh, three big community colleges, uh, Maricopa uh, Community Colleges, Ivy Tech Community College, and Miami Dade College. And then um, there actually is another grant that I can't even really talk about too much right now, but um, there's one coming, coming down the line soon. Um, which is uh, a similar kind of courseware development. So my expertise is really in um, these big kind of courseware development uh, and, and scaling kinds of grants. So at a high level, uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the things that have 
helped us are these are establishing early on uh, the collaborations. So um, targeting a, um, a, a kind of development and scaling grant, the strategy that has worked really well uh, for us is to um, is to have your your development partners be like big collaborations, so high impact collaborations. So with the Open Skill project, we were able to uh, how you know we had built up relationships with some you know what are probably three biggest community college systems in the country, and then um, they are really were were written into the grant as core collaboration and and not and, and and development partners so the key with that grant was really to not just talk the talk it was to really have the faculty engaged on the ground in iterative cycles of development in in the project so that i believe is core to our strategy um, you know, obviously, Arizona State University is a big place, big institution. Uh, we have the expertise uh, in the infrastructure and the scaling of high quality courseware. Uh, but it is essential to have the faculty on the ground to test assumptions um, and not get locked into any one uh, particular solution, um, have good user research on, on the ground and release early, get that feedback and adapt. So the open skill project is a very good example of that. Because we had faculty that were contracted, as um, Kelsey was saying, you know, you have either set up contracts or stipends, different states will do these things differently, but because they were uh, funded and the faculty had the time to dedicate to the project, um, then we were able to release mockups and, and then beta versions of our courseware and get lots of really good implementation um, feedback. And we were able to rapidly iterate and improve on, on the product. So um, I would say, that is a great strategy because when you have these large collaborations, uh, you, you then have the feedback you need, but also then the you know, institutions and the faculty feel like that this, you know, if they can see that you have actually um, provided critical feedback and, uh, to the product, then they are invested in the product. And then, uh, they are, you know, have a better understanding of, of it and uh, have an interest in trying to see it succeed and adopt it. So I would say that's one of the core um, things that we have learned along the way and how to, how to do that well. Um, so investing, you know, heavily in those, in those faculty, providing those, uh, the feedback. The, um, I would also say that it is important in terms of impact um, to have a really good, uh, you know, measurably um, set your your outcomes, um, but also be open to it, it changing. So, in the Open Skill Grant, we started with you know laser focus on the um, the, the saving students money for textbooks, and that is a very important. Uh, objective that we, you know, we wrote into the grant, but we, um, but we were able to kind of pivot in this project uh, and and focus in on what we're calling essential workforce skills, and that was something that the um, Department of Education wanted us to include, but it ended up being kind of core and central to our value proposition. So we, we had a pretty big pivot, you know, even in the middle of the grant and, um, and the outcomes that we put down, you know, we're, we were able to broaden our, our, our goals and outcomes um, for, uh, for this project. So we were actually able to extend them into, well, you know, what is the cost of 
uh, failing a course, you know, that is actually a very large cost. So we start to incorporate um, measuring outcomes in terms of skills, uh, you know, and what is their ability to, uh, you know, and improving pass rates, because, you know, that is also a large cost in the grant. So the, the evaluation um, and those metrics have, uh, have kind of changed um, throughout the project. So if you'd like, I can, uh, Matthew, just present a little bit more about uh, OpenSkill. And then happy to field lots of questions. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds good. All right. So I think I may need to have you stop sharing and then I can share. OK, great. All right. So just very briefly then, um, OpenSkill is OER tools that promote this active learning and implicitly teach essential skills. And so we, we our, our strategy there was, even though we were um, designing for textbook adoptions uh, in the specific set of courses, we, wanted to be able to reach massive scale by having discipline agnostic tools in addition to just the textbook replacements. So um, we saw the need uh, to improve the, the quality and through the improvement of the quality, we would lead to the expanded use of OER, which you know meets the requirements of the Department of Education, saving students money, but also um, improving student outcomes. And, the, you know, as I said, we had a pivot onto um, actually targeting what we're calling essential skills. That became a core uh, value proposition for us. The tools themselves, there are four uh, tools that where an instructor can actually come in and build their own assignments in a tool and then deploy it. So, um, as a funding source, uh, you know, this, this was a very good strategy because um, we, we've built this out as open source tools. Um, they can be adapted. They are discipline agnostic, so they can go in, uh, in massive scale. And, um, and we're not sitting on any proprietary technology uh, or relying on any proprietary for-profit company um, to deliver our products. So the, you know, if it, when we do deploy these um, through, you know, an LMS and, and bundle it with uh, OER, uh, we provide the option to use a, a, a platform, but that is again, an open source collaboration with Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and a platform that, um, you know, it, it doesn't lock us into any one particular uh, provider uh, because of it, because it is an open source platform that we could just spin up ourselves at ASU if we needed to, or you could. So that's the open skill project. The tools, like I said, can be bundled with textbooks and we are targeting these courses. Um, and in the interest of time, I can probably leave it there and just field questions. Uh, if there is extra time, I'm happy to show, do a little demo, but I think that is probably my time. Yeah, thank you, David. That's very, very, I mean, that's, that's a great overview of um, not just the Open Skill Project and, and the kind of the way in which I thought it was, I thought it was actually pretty interesting to hear about you know, project sets out with a with a really specific goal of saving students money, but then as you are kind of going through that feedback process and learning from faculty in the classroom that there are maybe some other ways that, you know, that, that the tools could be developed to make them more um, effective, that that kind of necessitated a change, you know, in in the, the measurements and, and trying to figure out like kind of even what the purpose was. And so the ability for that uh, flexibility and, and for the for the grant to evolve, I think is is helpful to see. Um, so and it's exciting, um, and I'm just speaking for myself here because I'm actually involved in it too. But it's it's exciting to to be in the in like the final 
year or the third year of, of, of this grant and see um, the tools finally coming to fruition. So, um, but yeah, so I mean, I'm just gonna go ahead and open up. There was one question in chat. We can probably start with that. And I'm just gonna um, say to any of our speakers here, uh, Jenny, Katie, Kelsey, David, um, feel free to um, jump in, I guess. But uh, so the question from uh, Frank, is uh, any tips on finding and recruiting other faculty to join in your OER projects? This is a really important question, I think. As David mentioned already, you know, getting the faculty buy-in on the ground is really important. But um, any thoughts on that? Um, I could add just re really quickly that I think what, what I'm not an expert in OER, so Matthew and others know much more actually about OER than me. But my experience has just been that different institutions are, are in different places, you know, in their journey on, on OER. So what was really interesting about this project was that you have different institutions at different um, places. And then by, by creating a collaboration across the institutions, the, you know, we can support each other in that, in that journey. So at one institution, they may have a very nascent OER committee you know, so start, you know, we, we start there. Others, you know, like Maricopa have a very, um, uh, you know, well-established OER project. So in, in my opinion, um, you know, if you, if you can focus and get on these collaborations and even if they're at different stages, uh, having, creating that network where you facilitate the sharing of resources across institutions, effectively cutting out any kind of publisher, um, that is a good strategy. I'll respond quickly to one other quick well, thing here. Oh, do you want, sure, do you want to add something? Oh, I was just going to see if Kelsey or Jenny or Katie had anything else to say about faculty um, recruitment. But if not, we'll just go ahead and move on. Go ahead, uh, Dave, what you wanted to respond to. Sure. Well, well, Kelsey wanted to add something. I'll just quickly respond. The, we need to add the um, MIT license for our open skill tools. So it's just a response to the licensing. Um, all the other OER is like the, you know, is the, um, we'll, we'll be adding the Creative Commons license. Right, oh, as far one. as recruiting oh, I'm faculty, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. as far as recruiting faculty, there there are just uh, a lot of ways to do that, and probably far too many for me to um, go into at this point uh, right now. But there are a lot of online um, guides to that, and then just a lot of people I'm seeing who are part of this um, webinar today, who you could probably even say are experts at it. Um, so if you wanted to contact me offline, I'd be willing to, I'd be very happy to connect you with all kinds of ideas and resources. So Great. I actually, I want to take that, this uh, conversation a little bit into the cost realm, um, if that's okay. <laughs> um, so one of the, you know, one of the things we've struggled with as we talk about how we measure and consistently uh, communicate um, the cost savings of OER is, is um, different. Everybody does their faculty differently. And so trying to get to a place where we could quantify every little dimension of how organizations um, compensate faculty in the development of OER is, would be a, a big mountain to climb and probably not one that we could actually get up. And so um, we've really been, you know, recognizing that there's so much variation in the field. Part of what we are trying to do through our cost conversations is think about where are the commonalities and how do we create a, a measure around that? And then like, this is a really good example of where there's uh, features of individual institutions and organizations. And so how do we create space in say our cost benefit analysis process for each entity to take into account their own work and the, their own system that they're using to approach that work. And so um, I think this, this point really illustrates um, some of the tension that we are working through through that work group. Well, thank you. Um, there is another question in the chat here that I think is uh, probably 
very interesting for a lot of folks. And it says, um, I applied for U.S. Department of Education grant for OER, but I lost a lot of points for not having community stakeholders provide detailed input into our plan. How do you recommend getting local businesses or civic organizations on board? That's a tough one. We we had an you know an, the 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 timeline to to create this to write up a grant was really aggressive for this one I remember so we had to build up an advisory board um, so maybe just having a workforce advisory board um, is a is a good strategy the the Department of Education I think asked for this when we had to submit um, in the in the timeline that we had, we, you know, it was, it was really hard to put together people, but, and, and, it, and, and that advisory board changed a lot over, over time, but I guess at least just having a few really good names um, of people that could, that could support that was, was essential. Um, it's, it's starting to lead to connections directly to companies like uh, big, big companies like Boeing, for example. So it's very exciting. So it is actually, tangibly having an impact on on the project and not just you know some meeting you need to do every month i don't know if that's helpful though you know i can talk a little bit about what we did in colorado um, for various different grants around stakeholder engagement there is a there are a lot of entities out there um, who are really interested in higher education right now um, and so whether that's an industry advisory committee as part of your Perkins work or a statewide workforce council or more on the higher education side. Um, there's a lot of advocacy organizations out there who are advocating for reduced costs. Um, we know, I know that there's some particular, uh, particularly um, active in states like California. And so Oftentimes we don't think about those organizations as partners, they're you know, advisors and they come do that one thing, but because they know our systems, um, our OER coordinator in Colorado was really good at just asking if they could weigh in on stuff um, that they wouldn't normally be asked to weigh in on. So um, think about what, and maybe search within your sphere of to what external groups already exist that might easily be able to kind of come in and bring some outside perspective. I could add a comment to, um, you know, how to work with faculty if you want, um, Matthew, just, just generally, because um, I think there's some questions going back and forth about, about that. One thing that I think is, how do you actually have, you know, like support faculty to transition to more evidence-based um, teaching practices? It's, you know, and I think a big blind spot, a blind spot in a lot of the research is actually implementation. So you can provide great tools and, uh, you know, courseware and, and things like that, but how it actually gets used on the ground you know in, in enabling a lot of academic freedom and pedagogical you know ownership um, of these products means that the implementation is key you know they're, they're very different use cases and so for, I think if you're going to propose something um, getting, you know targeting specifically one component of the learning sciences that you you know that we know works and then how you know, like active learning or sense of belonging and inclusion or metacognition, um, you know, transparency in the, the grading, you know, some of these things you, you can focus in on and then um, show how like you would, you would have a plan for bringing faculty along, you know, whether it be pro training professional development um, and then and then understanding the implementation piece, you know, saying that you are going to do an evaluation of implementation to really figure out what works for certain student demographics. That would be my suggestion.
Well, so are there any other questions or any, any last words that anyone wants to provide there? I know that the, like you said, Jenny, the, the suggestions for trying to involve faculty is, is that's something that we could, I mean, we, I think we have done entire webinars on that topic. So that might be something also, um, if the questions are still out there, um, you know, you could just check out some of the CCC OER uh, archive because our, our, we've got all of our webinars archived going back years now. So um, there's some pretty valuable information there. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and, and uh, go through the last couple of slides that I've got here. Thank you to all of our guest speakers again today. Um, oh, look, we had a nice question slide that we could have used, but we didn't. So we have some additional um, webinars coming up. Um, today, obviously, was this one. Two more this uh, this fall, we've got the intersection of EDI and Open on November 10th, and then we have a student panel on the impact of OER on December 8th. Um, it's always nice to hear from the student perspective on that kind of thing. So I hope to see you all there. And of course, you are invited to join the community email if you'd like to stay connected. Uh, there's a lot of, there's always great resources and the discussions uh, being shared um, on that email uh, list serve. So, please feel free to join that. You don't have to be a CCC OER member in order to do that. And, um, and also there are impact stories and blog posts. And like I said, we have the webinars archived as well. So there's a wealth of information on the CCC OER website that you're welcome to check out. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again to all of our uh, panelists or I guess our, our guests today. And um, we will see you next time.